Before we jump into Nirvana, let's first talk about MTV's unplugged concept so we can understand everything better. MTV had the brilliant idea of having famous musicians strip down arrangements from their biggest hits. And this concept was a hit for both the cable network and the music industry during the 90s. But did you know that HBO and PBS turned down the idea? Even MTV wasn't keen initially. It wasn't until Judy McGrath got a big promotion at MTV that they finally got the green light to make a pilot. And that pilot was cheap to make according to co-creator Robert Small. He faced a tight schedule and budget. He had just four hours to set up and another four to film, all with only $18,000 at his disposal. Without funds to hire a director, Robert found himself in the director's chair by necessity. MTV Unplugged was so successful that everyone wanted to take credits for it. Singer-songwriter Jules Shear swore up and down that the idea sparked in his mind to promote his acoustic album, The Third Party. Hi, this is MTV Unplugged, and I'm Jules Shear. Now, what we've got here is a bunch of people who are friends and acquaintances, and we sort of put them all, locked them all in a room last night with acoustic instruments, and what happened after that point is what this show is all about. He pointed to John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora's stripped-down performance at the 1989 MTV Video Music Awards as his inspiration. The first ever guests were Glenn Tilbrook and Chris Difford from Squeeze, but they misunderstood the assignment. Both came ready for rehearsal with electric guitars. Producer Alex Coletti said, Very funny, guys. Where are the acoustics? They looked at each other and went quick to make a phone call. But the idea of releasing the show's set as an album never came up until Paul McCartney considered it. He also realized that instead of just letting his work be scattered around, he could bundle it up into an album. I figured that as MTV Unplugged would be screened around the world, there was every chance that some bright spark would tape the show and turn it into a bootleg. So we decided to bootleg the show ourselves. We heard the takes in the car driving back. By the time we got home, we decided we'd got an album. Over time, the setup stayed consistent. An artist or band performing their popular songs along with a few covers in an unplugged style. I caught you knocking at my cellar door. It all started with McCartney's notion of a live album. And then came Clapton's Unplugged in 1992, which ended up being the top-selling live album ever. Other unplugged albums went platinum too. Like Mariah Carey in 1992, Rod Stewart in 1993, 10,000 Maniacs in 1993 too, Tony Bennett in 1994, and also Nirvana in 1994. If you're familiar with Nirvana, it probably won't come as a shock to learn that they initially didn't want to do what other bands did. Nirvana was not enthusiastic about doing the unplugged performance, as they wanted to do something different from the typical acoustic versions of their hits that other bands had done. So, they had some disagreements with MTV's producers over the setlist and production. As Dave Grohl explained during an interview with the AV Club, Kurt wanted to bring it down to the lowest, most dirge-like Leonard Cohen level, and it would have been more fun rather than just plugging in acoustic guitars. Dave Grohl said they always knew they were capable of creating an unplugged album, but it was just a matter of doing it right, and that meant doing things differently. We'd seen a lot of other bands do unplugged tapings, and what they'd done was basically rock out the songs as if they were playing electric instruments. They didn't do anything to change the songs, they just basically plugged in acoustic guitars instead of electric ones. There was no way we were going to try to pull off Smells Like Teen Spirit with fucking acoustic guitars. It wouldn't work. Eventually, and thank God, they imposed their vision by doing the performance their way, which ended up being a landmark moment in the careers of everyone involved. In all, they ended up playing one song from their debut album, Bleach, four songs from 1991's Nevermind, three tracks from In Utero, and six covers. At first, no one expected the iconic show we know today, 
Grohl said they thought it would be a disaster. He said, we hadn't rehearsed. We weren't used to playing acoustic. We did a few rehearsals and they were terrible. Everyone thought it was horrible. Even the people from MTV thought it was horrible. Then we sat down and the cameras started rolling and something clicked. It became one of the band's most memorable performances. In 1995, the band's tour manager, Alex McLeod, shared with Guitar World that it had been a while since he'd seen them all so nervous. He explained that they were particularly anxious about doing Unplugged because it meant exposing themselves in a different way. They were really nervous about doing Unplugged because they were really leaving themselves wide open. On top of that, Kurt Cobain was reportedly going through withdrawal. During the dress rehearsal, he was in bad shape, dealing with stomach issues and withdrawal symptoms, reportedly vomiting bile and blood. So remember how we talked about MTV Unplugged? Well, most bands played acoustic, but Nirvana did things a bit differently. Kurt insisted on using his electric guitar with his favorite Fender Twin and a reverb amp and some effects pedals. The producer had to hide all those gadgets, though. He confessed, Maybe I shouldn't give this secret away, but I built a fake box out in front of the amp to make it look like a monitor wedge. It was Kurt's security blanket. He was used to hearing this guitar through his Fender. He wanted those effects. You can hear it on the man who sold the world. It's an acoustic guitar, but he's obviously going through an amp. There's no trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. That's not the only thing Kurt had a say in. He also wanted a specific look for the set. The stage had a spooky vibe with stargazer lilies, black candles, and a crystal chandelier. Exactly like Kurt wanted the setup to be. When the show producer asked if he meant like a funeral. I think it was me. It wasn't Kurt, although it makes the story better. I was like trying to get a handle. It was like, like a funeral. And he said, yeah, yeah, like a funeral. That'd be cool. Now let's get to the part where Dave was almost uninvited to Nirvana's show. Nirvana's gig was supposed to be all acoustic, which meant Dave had to tone it down, and it was not an easy task. And Kurt was getting more and more annoyed during rehearsals. According to producer Coletti, Kurt was thinking of just replacing Dave behind the kit, or maybe not using a drummer at all. He didn't like the way Dave sounded playing drums with sticks. But then, the producer came up with a solution. I was really worried about Dave Grohl. Dave is a heavy drummer. I had sent a PA out to a music store to get brushes and these things they call sizzle sticks. They're little percussive sticks. They're a bunch of dowels wrapped together and they're much softer. So I don't know what came over me. It was around the holidays. I took some wrapping paper. I wrapped it up. And when Grohl came in, I was like, Merry Christmas. And he opened it up. He goes, wow, I never had brushes before. Cool. Kurt was a big fan of the meat puppets and wanted to support them. He likely wanted to use the high-profile, unplugged platform to expose the Meat Puppets to a wider audience, so he invited them to join the band on stage during their performance. In a chat back in 2014, Kurt Kirkwood from Meat Puppets recalled how they'd heard MTV wanted more famous bands, making them feel like they had somehow snuck in. After singing his last song, a really good version of Where Did You Sleep Last Night by Lead Belly, Kurt walked off and refused to come back. The producer really wanted him to do another song. He even had the rest of the band ready to go, but Kurt wasn't feeling it. He just said, I can't top that last song. After the show, Kurt was in kind of a weird mood, and so I asked him, what's up? And he said people weren't clapping very much. I think that they were really just so taken by what was going on and they were so taken by the performance that they weren't, uh, they weren't going to clap like that. After Cobain passed away, MTV started showing Nirvana's unplugged performance a lot. They were worried about people making illegal copies, so they struck a deal with the remaining band members to release it officially. It came out on November 1st, 1994 and topped the charts in North America, Australia and Europe. But it was bittersweet because it was the last big recording from the band. Less than six months after the taping, and before the album was released, Kurt Cobain passed away. 
In hindsight, many fans believe the acoustic session was a hint at what's to come. So what do you think? Make sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments down below.